Welcome again to Pleasant Valley Church. If you're new, we're so glad to have you. I want to welcome everybody also that is streaming uh, Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge. We were so blessed to have you guys in December down here. So hey, Um, traditions folks, hello across the hall. We're so thankful for you. And anybody else who maybe uh, is watching at home, couldn't get here, or you're watching later this week, we're very thankful for you. I'd like to pray for us, and then we are going to open God's word together. Jesus, you are amazing. Oh, to be like you, to give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one besides you. Lord, I sing those, and Lord, even just today, standing over there on the side, singing loud, and then every once in a while stopping and listening to this group of wonderful people singing. Uh, Lord, those songs reaching your ears this morning in heaven amazing to think about. Reaching your ears, uh, Lord, you lean in as we lean in. Lord, we want to be like you. We want to know you. And we ask now as we open your word that you would do what you promised to do, which is change us. God, that you would transform us, Lord, by the Holy Spirit, by words that have not changed, that are true, that will always be true from your word Um, Would they become a part of us today? Would they go after places that are sick or hurting or hard? And would we walk away just knowing you spoke to us? You went after us. We ask this in the wonderful and beautiful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Even if you're just jumping in with us this morning, we're going to get back to our study of the book of Hebrews Um, which is a wonderful book to point us to Christ, to get us thinking about him and to, and the author just keeps hammering and coming back again and again to who God is, to who God is in Jesus. And God speaks to me many times. Usually I, we take, I love our teaching team. It's one of my favorite things. One, because I usually get a couple of weeks before I have to jump up again. And God does crazy things in my life when I'm studying. And there are things, the way he speaks to me. And sometimes I'll be sitting there and I'll be studying and I've read it through several times and I'm praying and I'm trying to get an understanding and then an image will come to my mind. And this image on this first slide here came to my mind. These little ball knocker thing that people have on their desks. And I was like, what is that thing? And it just, it was like God was kind of just leading me to this thing, which happens to be called because I was thinking about this whole idea of Newton's first law, which I'm going to read to you, of motion and our hearts and how we can have some of these effects. So let me read the Newton's first law to you. It states this, that an object, so let's just say that object is you, will remain at rest or uniform in motion, meaning it will keep going in the same direction unless compelled to change its state by the action of an external force. In other words, layman's terms, if you are at rest or motionless in your relationship with Jesus, you're gonna stay right there until he knocks you, starts moving you. This thing actually happens to be called, I was thinking about Newton's first law, and I was like, oh, what image could, put, could I put up there? I was like, oh, what's that ball thing? What's that? Like, so I typed that into Google, ball knocker thing. <laughs> Google's amazing and actually brought this image up. And guess what it's called? Newton's cradle. And I was like, Lord, you are telling me something here. You're trying to speak. And so I just, I want you this morning to be thinking and asking the question, do I feel sluggish? Do I feel stalled maybe a little bit in my spiritual journey? Because if you do, and I have and do at times, you will need an external, and I will add spiritual force to knock you forward, to knock you into his grace, into his goodness that will change you. And Newton's first law applies Definitely, uh, there's some things supernaturally that come into play that go way beyond the laws of physics. But I wanted you just to start thinking about that because God's word, this right here, combined with the Holy Spirit, is the force that you need this morning to move you, 
to transform you, to knock you. And even we've, we talked about that. One of the great things about small groups is you are sitting with a group of people and you're gathered around this and it's like ball knocker. Dun, 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 dun. Everybody's pushing and there's talk and you're moving. And so if you're not in one, and that's a great way. The chair time thing we just, James just mentioned is another, we wanna teach you how to be in here because it is the one thing that God uses to speak. For sure, it's the primary way that he speaks. So his word, his Holy Spirit, the perfect combination this morning to be that external force to change you. And I wanna say this morning, if you are just like, they'll say, cause we're in Hebrews six today. And so that means, whoa, we've done five chapters already and I just jumped in here and I don't know what's going on. It's okay. You will have an immediate connection with what these people are feeling and what this little church that got this letter for the first time in Rome, what they were feeling. You're going to have an immediate place of, oh, that's just like me. That's what I feel because they were feeling a bit sluggish. They were feeling things slow down and, and wanting basically to kind of give in to the culture. And what was the culture doing? Had a hostile view towards their Christianity. Oh, do we live in a culture that has a hostile view towards Christianity? You bet. Sure we do. True following of Jesus. A true following of Jesus will always get you in trouble. Always. That is, that's what he said. You will have trouble <laughs> in this world, but don't worry. I've overcome the world. And so we know that's what was going on with them. Hey, guess what? That's what's going on with us. So there's a connection right away. And they felt like I would rather not have trouble. I would rather just, you know, chill, slow it down, not have people so upset with me. Tolerance, low key religion was the name of the game. And it is today too. That's what people want. You want to not cause trouble? You want to not make waves in culture? Slow down with your Jesus talk. Don't be so extreme. Get out there. Serve the poor. Do something nice. Give some money. Join a cause. Don't be so Jesus-y. That's pretty much what you'll hear. That's what they will say. They like certain things about him, other things they do not like about him. So the temptation for them and for us is to pull it back, to say, okay, let's, let's be, because what happened is there were many gods in Rome, many, and they were tempted to just, you know, let's just, we don't have to go all the way over to worshiping multiple gods, but hey, we used to be a part of Judaism, and so let's go back to the Jewish kind of way of doing this, which still says there's one God and it says there's a future Messiah and a King, but it's not so saying that Jesus is the Christ. And I just this week was, sometimes it's good to learn about, you know, we say Jesus Christ. Christ means anointed one, but specifically it means God's anointed King. Psalm 2, the nations rage. They look up to heaven and they shake their fists and they say, you can't do anything about us. We rule this place. And it says, he who sits in heaven laughs. And he says, I have put my king on my holy hill. Jesus Christ, when you say, I believe in Jesus Christ, you are saying, I believe in the one and only king of the universe for now and for all time. Do you think that plays well in a society in Rome which said, oh no, Caesar is God and there are many other gods and you're trying to tell us there's one? and that there was one sacrifice, and that there's only one way to follow him? No, we're going to hurt you if you keep saying that. And so they're feeling that. They've been persecuted. And so what do they want to do? Let's just, let's just be quiet. And so this guy who wrote Hebrews said, don't be quiet. Look to Jesus. So as we open up this morning to Hebrews chapter 6, he's been trying to say this for five chapters. And he's used words like this. You might drift. You're going to become dull of hearing. You are not paying attention to Jesus. You're neglecting him. You're not considering him. You're not holding fast your confidence. You may be hardening your heart. You may be giving in to unbelief. You may have a lack of fear of the Lord. You're not striving. You may not be drawing near. There's immaturity. We need to grow up. And you seem to be indifferent to that lack of growth. And his words up to this point and still to this point are, look to Jesus, 
Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. And they're saying, we just want to turn a little bit, turn it down a little bit. Did you know that you can turn away from Jesus and still think you're following him? You can kind of have a half way. They're tempted to not be so radical. And it doesn't need, they didn't think, well, it doesn't need to be a full turn. Just kind of, you know, we're not so extreme. You can kind of follow Jesus and not be following him at all. And this is going to be the, this, and I'm going to tell you this passage this week, it's like one of those where I'm reading it and I'm like, ah, like it feels like that. You're like, don't look at it. Like almost like you're getting a shot at the, at the doctor's office. You're like, just don't, don't, oh, I guess I want to, I want to look. It feels like that because when he says things, that he's going to say, you could turn, you could kind of be following him and then find out I was never following him at all. I was never looking to him. So Hebrews 6, if you want to open there, we have Bibles under the chairs. You've got them on your phones. We've got it up here. You can also just listen. Listen to how he jumps in to basically saying, look to Jesus once again. Don't be sluggish. Here's what he says. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. What? Those are elementary things? And this we will do if God permits. Did you know that there are spiritual ABCs? And I grabbed this image on purpose because I was like, what is that? When I looked at it, the formula behind there. It's like, yeah, that's, I was just thinking about that at breakfast. <laughs> there are spiritual ABCs, things that you want to learn. And so I remember when we were preparing to go get Maya in Vietnam, we thought, Vietnam, another culture. We should learn some Vietnamese. We got tapes. Folks, we didn't make it past the alphabet. It was so hard. Like, I mean, it was like, I was listening to this going, What? That doesn't sound at all like ABC. And so I look at this list that he just said, and I say, if these are the basics, where am I? Where am I if these are the basics? What kind of basics was he saying? Let me say them again. Repentance from the dead and works of faith toward God, instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, you know, kid stuff. <laughs> Not really, is it? I was, I just, I felt overwhelmed and the author is pretty much saying, can we just, you know, can we do some more advanced stuff? I mean, do we need to go over this again? Which if you're one of those guys in class like me who didn't want to feel like they didn't, I didn't want to be caught not knowing something. And so you're like, sure, I'm, I'm good. I got journals full of that stuff. <laughs> Repentance and eternal whatever death, not that eternal life and you feel overwhelmed reading something like that. I had those kinds of classes all through my education. It's weird. Now, I'm a big reader. I love to read. Man, I really wasn't in college, <laughs> and I wasn't for sure in high school. And I remember going into classes, specifically in college, two classes in particular, art, history, and music appreciation. I'm pretty sure I missed more than I went. Seriously. And they had, you had classes like that in college where you're like, oh, this is easy. I can just read this stuff and I don't have to show up. But there were times when I would go back in and bit, I'd missed a couple. And I'm like, you know, I should go. I, I, I really should go to this class. And you go in there and he start talking about this stuff and saying, you know, we've been over this and this and this. And I'm like, yeah, we have. What is he talking about? <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about. So that's exactly how I feel when I read a passage like this. I feel I'm in so much trouble because I don't know what he's talking about. I don't feel, that doesn't seem elementary to me. I don't think that's what he's trying to accomplish here. I don't think he's trying to make you feel small. I don't think God is trying to make you feel little and like you don't know things. But I have this quote from C.S. Lewis, which I think is a good one for us to think about this morning. We must lay before him what is in us, not what ought to be in us. Lay before Jesus, say, here's what I got. Not what you think he wants, but just this is me. 
And it's in thinking, because this is really the intent of the author of Hebrews. He starts laying down this stuff, and he's wanting you to look inside and to see, are these things a part of my life? True maturity in Jesus isn't what we bring to him. It's what he brings to us. It isn't what we offer. It's what he brings to us. And so his intent is not to make you feel small or like you don't know anything, but he brings up the basics to instruct us, to give us understanding, to show us what should be a part of our life. If we know Jesus, there should be evidence. We should be those who are repenting on a daily basis. We should be those who are placing our faith in Jesus. We should be those who are looking to our eternal future with him. And for sure, we think about the judgment of seed of God someday, that there will be a final judgment. And I want to be ready. And I want to be there. And I want to make sure that when he talks about washings, that's what he's saying. We know that you're not going to be into that religious stuff anymore, right? Because that's what they do. Like, oh, I've done, my, I've done my washings. I've done my readings. I've done all this stuff. I, I'm good with God, right? He says, We've been over that. You can't earn this. There should be evidence of things in your heart, but you can't earn this. And so instead, we should be asking questions like this. When he lists stuff like that, we should be saying, who can lead me to repentance daily? Jesus. Who can help me daily put to death my own works? Jesus. Who gives the gift of faith? Jesus. Who instructs me daily from his wisdom and his righteousness? Jesus, who lays his hand on me, calling me to serve him, to give up my life for his kingdom? Jesus does. Who is drawing me to consider my future, my heavenly home, to ready my heart for the life I will have with him, to be ready for the day of days and the final judgment? Christ, Jesus, he is the one. And the author wants to get you and remind you, it's him. It's what he does. So that made me feel a little uncomfortable. I'll be honest. Those ABCs, I was like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> That's not ABC to me. I'm struggling. If that made you feel a little uncomfortable, the next part will rip off the Band-Aid. Are you ready? Cool. Verse 4. Listen to this. This is a fun one. Here we go. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it's impossible to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. And then he gives an illustration, a farming illustration, which would have made a lot of sense to them back then, for the land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it, produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated, receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. It's impossible? I thought nothing was impossible for God. That's how I, this is, I want to teach you guys, and part of this too is even if if you come to chair time, week one, Lisa and I, my wife Lisa and I are doing week one. Um, I want to show you how to interact with God's word like a person. And not just, uh, read it, okay, great. But to ask those questions, it's impossible. Wait a minute, what about those other verses I've read about that say nothing is impossible? It's impossible to restore them again. That little phrase right there has caused quite the mountain of distress in the church through the centuries. Why? Because people ask this question, can I lose my salvation in Jesus if I have a couple of bad days? Some people will read this passage and go, yep, you sure can. Not so fast. Scripture must interpret Scripture. It's one of the main rules. You can't just pull a verse out and say, I'm going to do this because it said this. And look, they were killing people there, so that's why I killed people yesterday. No. Okay? Scripture must interpret Scripture. And so what are some other verses that we can look to to talk about our salvation in Jesus, and whether or not it's a sure, secure, firm thing. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. Oh, you mean we don't earn it? No. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. Romans 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, things to come, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. It's a very important part. Philippians 1.6, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 1.4, there is an inheritance if you've given your life to Christ, that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power, I love this, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Scripture interprets scripture. So I'm telling you, you look at that, and I'm just going to tell you right now what we believe, what we understand theologically, you cannot lose it. But you could be in a place where you never had it. Oh, I'm not sure I like that answer either. You can't lose it once you have it, but you could be in a place where you never had it. You could be fooling yourself. You could be going through the motions. So with those verses in mind, what is he talking about? Who are these people? Here's the problem. These folks have done some serious religion. They have church chops. They got it down. They've been through the motion. They've experienced it, but it's not real. It's not real. If I was the guy described in this passage and somebody, you asked somebody, hey, tell us about Chad. Let's just say I was off the rails and doing all this other stuff. Tell us about him. If I was this guy, someone could accurately say about me, if I had walked away and had done everything that you know about me thus far, here's what they could say about me. He's nowhere. He's nowhere. If I walk away permanently, and, and disgrace the name of Jesus, which the passage says is like crucifying him again and say, I'm done, publicly disgrace him. You could accurately say about me, he's nowhere. Now we knew him to be this. We knew all of this about him. He could preach up and down. He could do this. He could sing, whatever. But if I reject him, what the passage is saying, if I in the end reject him, I'm nowhere. I'm nowhere. Now, from what he's describing, you could be a fairly smart and knowledgeable believer or church goer and still be in danger because knowing about God isn't enough. Why do I say that? Because as my pastor back home said, Satan could write the best theology book ever written. He knows it all. You could preach this book backwards and forwards with beautiful creativity and accuracy and theologically correct words and still be nowhere. Because as John Piper says, this passage tells us that you can look like you have salvation, but it isn't there. And so what's the text for? It's a warning. It's a warning for us not to assume that we are secure when our lives have some religious experience, but there's no fruit. There's no fruit. We're still sinning like the day is long. We're, going, we're not listening to God's voice. Maybe we come to feel a little better on Sunday, but as far as the week goes, there is no fruit there. There's no tenderness. There's no kindness. There's no humility. There's no confession of sin. We don't care. We'll go and listen, but we don't care. There's no fruit. It's a warning. And we know from the scripture that Jesus said that there will be those on the final days who said, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We preached in your name. We read our Bibles. We had chair time. We went to church. We were in small groups. We did this. And he will say to them, I never knew you. I got to be honest with you. I, like, I don't like the tension in this passage. It's hard. It's hard because it makes me look here. You can experience Jesus and not know him. How's that possible? Well, think about Judas. Three years he knew him. He experienced the miracles of Jesus. He heard his voice. He broke bread with him. He was sent out with the other disciples and actually performed miracles with them, healed people, spoke to them, and then we all know what happened to him. So after this pretty intense discussion, in this passage where you have like a full-on 
whoa, that doesn't seem like there's a lot of grace there. What's going on? You're not left with butterfly kisses from Jesus from this passage, are you? It doesn't feel like, oh, let's put that on a mug. (laughs) I promise you it won't sell. Can you imagine? Like, it's not, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. It's, it's impossible to restore those who have fallen away. (laughs) It won't sell. It's hard. It's a warning. It feels like a warning. It feels like an alarm. What do you want to do to an alarm? Snooze. Knock it across the room. I don't want to hear it. It's too hard. It's natural for us to want the tension of this passage to go away. Jesus doesn't want it to go away, though. He doesn't want it to be gone because it's a good thing to be in awe. It's a good thing to have a reverent fear of God. It's a good thing to get low in what we think we understand, to humble ourselves before God. And he could be trying to warn you this morning. Don't get rid of the alarm. So the turn he takes in this next part of the passage, I think is, is a classic parenting move. After you've done like a really, listen to me, young lady, you know, it's a classic parenting move. Look what he does here in verse nine. Though we speak in this way, yeah, really hard. Yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things. Things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name and serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. Here it is. So that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. It's almost as if he just said, you know, I'm not talking about you, right? You know, I'm not talking about you and your walk with Jesus, to which I want to say, well, who are you talking to? You just said this really hard stuff, and then you just said, oh, but I know that's probably not you, right? Classic parenting move. Many people ask, well, Mo, he was just talking to believers in this passage. There weren't any people that didn't believe. If it's a church, (laughs) okay, if it's a good church, it should be comprised of three types of people, believers, skeptics, and seekers. It's my hope that Pleasant Valley is that place. I don't want this place full of believers only. That means we're not doing our job. That means we're not out there talking to people. If you're in process this morning, you don't know if Jesus is the real thing, good. I'm glad you're here. This is the right place. This is the right place. You belong here. God is moving. He is working and he's coming after your heart. One of the cool things hidden in this little section where he does this kind of come alongside the, the, your child and say, it's okay, I know I just said a lot of hard things, but it's okay, sweetie, you're gonna be all right, is he does tell us the kinds of things that should show evidence of our faith. Things like working and serving for God on behalf of God in the church God knows he's not in justice to overlook your work, the way you've served, the evidence of your faith, that you are showing earnestness in your faith, that you're pursuing, that you're imitating others in faithfulness. And then he says this, the promise of God in Jesus Christ, those who are looking to the promise, imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise, the promise, the promise. Now, this is a great thing about the Bible and one of the things where we don't want to explain away the tension or try to get rid of it because he starts with this huge warning that says, make sure you're following him. And then he finishes with, with this thing that says, oh, by the way, God is going to get this done. God is going to get this done. Wherever you land in your interpretation of that passage, which I, I believe fully that it is saying that those who fall, fell away did not know God in the first place but that it's not that we don't listen to it. Wherever you land, both sides agree on one thing, which is how you should respond. How you should respond when you hear the author saying, it's impossible to restore again to those who have fallen away. You should have this holy fear in your heart and you should pursue Jesus with earnestness. 
You should run hard after him. You should believe in him with all your heart. You should not press snooze on the alarm. You should not say, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear it anymore. At Wheaton College, we had this guy who thought it would be funny to pull the alarm, the fire alarm in the middle of winter three times in one night. He didn't go to Wheaton after that night. Um, <laughs> but by the third time, I was so annoyed. You know, the first time you're like, okay, okay, I'm going to do something. By the third time, I was literally taking my sweatshirt and putting it on as pants. Like the arm of my sweatshirt was going to, and my roommate was like, what are you doing? I was like, I don't know. I wanted that alarm to go away. Jesus is saying, don't ignore the alarm. If God is sounding it in your heart, don't miss Christ this morning. Don't miss Jesus. And he finishes with this, and let's read this final passage a few closing thoughts here. For when God made a promise, so here it is, warning, 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 and then let me tell you about God's promise. When God makes a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, I surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise for people swear by something greater than themselves and in all their disputes an oath is the final confirmation. So when God desired to show us more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. And we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. We, on our behalf, we have Jesus who has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Next week, Pastor Joe is finally going to talk about this guy, this mystery guy, Melchizedek, um, that the author really loves talking about, okay? And it's going to make a lot of sense. Pastor Joe will be awesome. So I'm not going to say anything more about that, but I am going to say we do have a sure and steadfast anchor for the soul in Christ. And I love this because basically, you remember that when you were kids, we used to say that I cross my heart and hope to die. Yeah, it, it was, I'm really serious about this promise. I'm really serious. God does two things here and they are eternal and irrevocable. They cannot be taken back. He makes a promise, and we know he can't lie. And then two, he says, I swear in the name of me. He's the only one who can swear in his name. We don't know that because our parents used to spank us if we ever said, I swear to, don't you dare. I swear in the name of me. Basically, God, is, it's a double down promise. I will get you there. My promise cannot be taken away in Christ. And what's the promise? That we have Jesus who has gone before us, behind the curtain, which is a reference to what we know was the temple and the Holy of Holies. And if you know anything about the New Testament, when Jesus died on the cross, what happened to that curtain? It ripped from top to bottom. Behind there was where the presence of God dwelt. It's where the priests went once a year to offer sacrifice for the sins of the people. And Jesus is basically saying, you have access. Today, you have access because of me. But guess what? That's not all that he's saying. That's not all that he is saying. What he is saying is that Jesus has gone to the place where the presence of God dwells. Where is that? Heaven. Heaven. He has gone to his heavenly throne room. He has made a way, and that anchor is rooted deep down and cannot be pulled away if you know Jesus. So we have God's promises placed alongside the warning of the first 12 verses. And can I just tell you something? Don't try to get rid of the tension. Don't do it. Be okay with that. Be okay with waking up tomorrow going, I need, to, I need to be earnest in my faith in Jesus. And then sleep soundly knowing that pff, this promise is like locked in. This promise in Christ is locked in. And somebody said this, honestly, if you're one of those people who's worried about your salvation, you're probably good. <laughs> it's, it's those that who don't even care. They're not even thinking. If you're like, I wonder if everything's okay, you're probably good. 
God is already doing something wonderful. But the passage is telling us, don't be sluggish, pursue, go after him hard, run hard, pursue. We have strong encouragement to hold fast. And there's a little phrase kind of hidden at the beginning of the passage when he was talking about the ABCs that I want to finish with. And he said this, this we will do if God permits. This what we will do. We will go on to maturity. We will grow. We will be solid in the foundations of the basics and we will learn about the advanced stuff like Melchizedek, which is what he wanted to talk about. I want to talk to you about this, but you're so dull of hearing that you, I can't talk to you about it. We will be solidly secure in Christ because of his promise. But he tells us, so run hard, believe, give yourself, serve, be a part of what God is doing, give, let your life be fixed on Jesus. And then you realize that, no, you're not earning anything with that. It's just because he loves you and because of what he's done in your heart, you want to. It's evidence. It's something that's happening in your heart. This we will do if God permits. And if we trust and believe in the name above all names, Jesus, because his word tells us he's gone ahead. He's already gone ahead to secure and assure your future with him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for um, passages that kind of get in us and go after our hearts and are okay to not leave us alone, Lord, to let it be something that's hard, um, that there's a tension there of I thought it was all about grace and I thought this was, God was securing this and it is. But the author of Hebrews also wants to spur us on. He wants us to not be sluggish in our faith and to not give in to the things of the world and to not give in to temptation and to pursue him, Lord, and to know the basics and to go beyond the basics, to be those who are teaching others and who are leading others to you, Jesus. And so God, we, I just ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would find that one place in the passage. One thing in the passage, Lord, where you were saying, this is for you today. This is what I want you to do. This is the sin I want you to confess. And I just tell you this morning, if God is wanting you to confess something, if he has brought up in your mind when somebody said to you, don't be sluggish, or you need to pursue him and you need to go beyond the basics. And the first thing that came to your mind was, oh yeah, but I've got this addiction. I've got this thing in my heart. Can I just tell you there's freedom to let it go today. There's forgiveness to let it go today in Christ. Lord, we believe that. Lord, we know that that is your heart, Lord. Um, And we ask Jesus that you would move in us, Lord. Pray that you would spur us on to love and good deeds, Lord, to trust you, to allow your Holy Spirit to move in us, to grow us, to mature us. And this we will do if God permits, Lord. We know that's your heart. That's what you want to do. Lord, as we close in worship, would you solidify your word? Would you speak loud and clear to us? We ask this in Christ's name.